Good morning, church, and welcome to worship on this second Sunday of Advent. We are so glad to have you with us for this I Worship experience. We want to give a special welcome to our guests this morning. For those who are not connected regularly to the life of First Christian Church, we would encourage you to leave a comment in the section of this video or to send us a message on Facebook so we can give you some information about who we are as members of First Christian Church in St. Angelo. We are excited to begin this second Sunday of Advent focusing on the idea of peace. Before we begin worship this morning, there are a few announcements I would like to share with you. First, I want to remind you that there are several uh, kids still needing to be adopted in order for us to make Christmas possible for many families throughout Tom Green County. And we're also collecting donations so that we can use those funds to go and purchase uh, a Christmas dinner for those families as well. You can find all that information on our church website, and we'd hope that you might prayerfully consider supporting that ministry. And also, I want to remind you that this evening from 5.30 until 8 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall, there's going to be an opportunity for children and youth to engage in their annual Christmas party. Sarah has worked really hard to plan some really exciting activities, including an art project that is sure to be lots and lots of fun. So I would encourage you to come and be a part of that as well. We are so excited for all that is happening this season during Advent. Stay up to date on social media. Follow us on on our website. And if you're not getting our weekly constant contact emails, call the church office so we can update your information so you can be as connected as possible with us this season. And for those who might be in St. Angelo, uh, we want to encourage you, if you feel comfortable, to come and join us physically in the sanctuary at 11 o'clock this morning for worship. Regardless of how it is we connect, it is my prayer that the Spirit of God might fill in the gap or the space in between us. And today we might have an encounter with the Holy as we explore the idea of peace as we come to a moment of worship together as one faith community. Let us worship.
through the cradle cross and pray see the love of God displayed now he's risen and he reigns praise the name above all names I dream of the first pitch of opening season. I dream of a laundry day where each sock finds its mate. I dream of family home for the holidays. I dream of good books and homemade meals. I dream of sunset drives with the windows down. These are beautiful dreams, but I also have urgent dreams. I dream of conversations across party lines. I dream of more bridges and less walls. I dream of more laughter and less fear. I dream of more listening and less tears. But most of all, I dream of peace like a river. Today, we light the candle of peace. May it remind us that there is another way. Will you join me in prayer? Holy God, we wish that peace was something we could buy. We wish that peace could be ordered in a subscription service, found on a map, downloaded in an app, or voted for in a ballot. We wish that peace was as easy as a one-time choice when we were feeling our best. However, we have found that peace involves everyday decisions over and over, whether or not we are feeling our best. So today we confess, in front of this community of faith, we confess that we need your help this Advent season. Prepare the way for greater peace and teach us how to be a part of it. Amen. Scripture reading today comes to us from Mark 1, verses one through eight. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Today is a day of peace. It is today that we light the peace candle as together we dream of a world without conflict and freedom from fear of violence. Often we can think of peace as an inner behavior that alters our being in the world. But it seems unusually true this season. Though we are on the verge of a vaccine and on the heels of a new calendar year, that peace is especially hard for us. In this moment of chaos, peace is hard for us to find. But we are not alone in our struggle. I believe that in the scripture text that Sarah just read, the audience of John the Baptist they too were struggling to find peace. It is a familiar scene. It's one that we have replayed in our heads a thousand times. 
a large crowd gathering around John the Baptist, this uncut, dirty preacher type who lived on the margins of society, calling his audience to repentance and transformation. You see, John understood that for peace to be reality, his followers must first do the difficult work of self-work. John was a radical, and it would have been easy for his audience to reject his message. And yet in today's story, we learn of people by the dozens responding to John's call, responding to the invitation to begin this journey of repentance and transformation. But why? Why were they so quick to respond to repentance and transformation? It is because there was something about John's message that they were drawn to. And I believe they were drawn to the the message of peace that John was preaching. But peace is not without risk. John's call for repentance and transformation meant retreating to the edge of the wilderness, leaving security and safety and comfort. You see, when responding to John's call to be baptized, people were willing to risk their very identity in order to receive the good news that John had been preaching. Yes, the call to repentance at first glance, it it does not appear to be good news. But repentance involves facing the truth about ourselves and changing the direction of our lives. Repentance can be seen as a course correction, a complete change in direction, a 180 degree turn. On the surface, the idea of repentance certainly does not equal good news. And yet when your world is falling apart, when you are paralyzed by addiction or plagued by financial hardship, or trapped in a loveless marriage, or devastated by grief, the idea of a course correction can be a gift from God. And even when our world is mostly kept neat and clean, sometimes a restart is exactly what we need. So yes, John's call for repentance is indeed good news. And it's the good news that we have come seeking today, because it's the good news of peace. What John the Baptist was inviting his followers to, what John the Baptist is inviting us to, is a practice of self-examination in hopes to getting on the right track with God. And there's no shortcuts in this journey. At the end of today's text, John the Baptist, he proclaims, the one who is more powerful than I is coming. At the heart of his message, he shouts, prepare the way for the Lord. Often Advent is seen as a season of preparation. And in our preparation, we too must be a people who's quick to respond to the call of John the Baptist, to repent and be transformed. Our preparation should be a turn toward God. And that work is bigger than just self-work. In the book, Prepare the Way for Justice by Tracy Blackman, He says, preparing the Lord's path means challenging systems and structures that we have institutionalized as normal, but God has condemned as oppressive and cricket. What Tracy offers is a dream, a dream that is in line with Christ's call for thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And that's the invitation of John the Baptist this morning. So I want to invite you to imagine with me. Imagine yourself moving alongside the crowd, retreating to the margins of the wilderness, seeking repentance and an opportunity to be changed. It's unclear why you said yes, why you said yes to to following this crazy guy named John the Baptist, and yet there's something about him that you are drawn to. Perhaps it's because you find yourself lacking this inner peace that today is all about. But make it personal. For you, what's at risk when you make the decision to respond to the call of John the Baptist? What in your life do you need to make a 180 degree turn away from? And as you approach these holy waters, the waters of baptism, 
you are faced with a choice. Because it is not ordinary waters that are before you. You cannot receive the holy waters of baptism without being forever changed. So what does that change or transformation look like for you? Perhaps your journey to the holy waters that Christ is calling you to, this moment of transformation that is right before you, is to no longer be a voice that is silent when you witness injustice, something we all struggle with. Or maybe this journey of transformation, this calling of John the Baptist, this moment of entering into the holy waters of baptism. Maybe it is a willingness to be made uncomfortable when challenged with issues of equality. To acknowledge that for many of us, our life has been a lived life of privilege. And yet we believe that God is still working. And even when we do not fully understand, we must repent and acknowledge that there's a whole community of people that because of the color of their skin, they have been marginalized and outcast. Maybe the call for repentance, the transformation before you, is to do something about that issue, an issue that is relevant in our world today. And the question is, are we going to be on the right side of history? when it comes to racial equality. Or as I think about the invitation to be transformed, I am reminded of a conversation I have had with a member of this church on more than one occasion. She has described to me her journey to better understand issues surrounding the LGBTQ community. She has self-confessed that in recent past, she was very uncomfortable and even against that lifestyle. But because of recent relationships she's have formed, particularly formed with people in this church, she has found a new understanding. And she would now say that she's not just tolerant, but she is accepting. Church, as I think about this call to holy waters, that story is the exact story of transformation that we need to hold on to. But what about you? What does your journey look like? But don't be too quick to answer that question because that is tough work. In fact, it's the very work that is before us, the work of realizing God's dream for our world. Because God's dream for our world is one of love and liberation. It is a message that is to be shouted and heard and received. And I believe the time is now. The time is right for this work. One preacher says it like this. At Advent, God's people summons the courage and the spiritual strength to remember the holy waters break into the daily. In tiny ways, we can open our broken hearts to the healing grace of God who opens the way to peace. His prayer is, may that peace come upon us like healing oil, as a mighty winter river gushing and rushing to the valleys of our prideful fear and our own self-righteous anger. And so, do not lose heart. Rather, we live our hearts broken open so that compassion, caring, and God's reckless love can find a way into our hearts and the heart of our world. Make straight in our heart a highway to the possibility of peace. Make straight in our heart a highway to the possibility of peace. Church, that is my dream. As we hear the call of John the Baptist to journey to the holy waters, to be baptized, to repent, and to be transformed, it is my dream that we might have the courage to allow God's reckless love to break through. Even when it makes us uncomfortable, even when the temptation is to resist and turn away from God, My prayer, my dream, is that we may be a people of peace. A people of peace. Amen.
It is the light of Bethlehem that draws us to this table. The gift of broken bread and poured out cup. The gift of love that Jesus modeled throughout his ministry. The model of peace that is discovered every time we eat of this bread and drink of this cup. The invitation that you, wherever you are, are invited to partake in. For we gather around this table and we are reminded that Jesus took the bread, lifted it, blessed it, and broke it, saying, Take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. Likewise, he took the cup, he lifted it and said, Take and drink, for this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you. As often as you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. We want to invite you to pause as a family and share in holy communion in this moment of peace that we are so desperately seeking. Together, let us share in God's greatest gift. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for worship. We are so grateful that you chose to spend your morning with us on iWorship. I want to remind you that immediately following this service, Sarah is going to jump on with some uh, children's sermon activities. But this is appropriate for all ages, so stick around, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hello families, boys and girls, I'm really excited to be with you again uh, this Sunday and we are back with our Little Dreamer series. And today, boys and girls, we are going to read a book about someone who I really admire. We're gonna talk about two really important people today. We're gonna to talk about John the Baptist and why he's so important. And then we're gonna talk about Rosa Parks. She's one of my favorite historical figures in the United States. And we're going to talk about how both of these people paved the way for change. That means they made the way happen for change in the world. Now, how did they do that? Well, let's find out. We're going to read Rosa. This is a little story about Rosa Parks and her life. Rosa grew up near Montgomery, Alabama. She was very little and very brave. She was very little and very brave. Her grandparents told her stories about a terrible time when black people were not allowed to be free. Can you imagine? Rosa did not complain, but sometimes she had to speak up for herself. Good for her, she advocated for herself. That's what that's called. When Rosa grew up, her life was full of unfair rules. I see some unfair rules. That says colored entrance, colored and white. That means black people could only drink out of this water fountain and white people could only drink out of that water fountain. Rosa met a man who was trying to change the rules. She started working to do this too. One day, a bus driver told Rosa to give her seat on the bus to a white man. It was unfair. She said, no. Notice everyone else on the bus is white. And now they're telling her she has to go to the back, but she didn't. Rosa was taken to jail, <gasps> to jail. When she came home that night, she made a plan. She fought to make buses fair and told everyone to stop riding them. She said, this isn't fair. You shouldn't support those buses. And then she told people all around the country to help. Finally, the rules changed. So she changed things. Rosa kept working to change more rules. She fought for all people who were treated unfairly. Her. That's called justice, boys and girls. People, people told Rosa she was a hero, but she knew that there was still work to do. So she kept on working. Ugh, 
I love Rosa Parks. She inspires me. So let's talk about Rosa Parks for a minute first. How did she help the help things change? And these are the questions I want you to, in just a moment, that you're going to stop and you're going to discuss with your family, okay? So how did Rosa help prepare the way for others? Hmm, interesting question. How do you think she learned to be so brave? I wonder. I wonder where she learned that from. What is it like to be the first one to do something? And like I did last time, I'm gonna answer one of those questions before we take a brief break so you can discuss with your families. Um, my question I'm choosing is, what is it like to be the first one to do something? My answer to that question is probably kind of scary, right? I mean, if you're the very first person to do something, especially something really big like that, like she did, she stood up to all of these white people and said that things should change. That was probably pretty scary. Man, it's a good thing she had her faith, right? And so discuss that with your families. And we are reading today from Mark. So you will see the scripture at the bottom of the screen under the questions. If you will read that scripture as well about John the Baptist and we will be back shortly. Okay, so now let's talk about John the Baptist. If you read in the scripture, you read how John the Baptist made the way or paved the way um, of sorts for the coming of Jesus. So John the Baptist is really similar to Rosa Parks because John the Baptist spent a lot of his life, his adult life, speaking about the coming Messiah, about this Lamb of God that was going to be coming to earth. And then guess what? He came, right? And John the Baptist even got to baptize this Lamb of God. Who is who? Who's the Lamb of God? Jesus, that's right. So John the Baptist paved the way. He started talking about Jesus before Jesus began his ministry. So people started to learn about him even before he did what he was called to do. And Rosa Parks paved the way because she helped it make it fair in America for black people and white people fair in that we have equal rights. So we're allowed to do the same thing. So moving away from our lesson today, I want you to think about this coming week. What are ways that you can help prepare for peace in the world? What are ways that you can help prepare for peace in the world? And I have all sorts of ideas. I, you guys probably don't have have enough time to use it and listen to Miss Sarah's ideas because I can I could just list and list. So I hope that you have fun creating a list of ways that you can bring peace to the world. And I will do the same with my family. Have a good day.